Hey Wargamers, today I want to talk about Cao Yan. It's largely been written off as the inferior tactical philosophy to Mon Ka, and that's pretty accurate, right? Like Mon Ka is very strong. But what if we wanted to use Cao Yan? What if we wanted to make that a priority in our gameplay, in our list design? How might we do that? Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today is just some you know general ideas that I had about how we might want to use Cao Yun and a particular list that I think would work well in that concept. So if you don't remember, uh, because we don't talk about it anymore, Cao Yun is the alternative tactical philosophy that you can select. It's active in battle rounds three through five, so the second half of the game. And uh, it says that units benefiting from Cao Yun are eligible to shoot in a turn in which it fell back. Uh, but if it does, then until the end of the turn, each time a model in this unit makes a range attack, subtract one from that attack's hit roll. So you can fall back and shoot, but there's a slight penalty for that. Um, and then it also says that each time a model in this unit makes a ranged attack that targets the closest eligible enemy unit within 12 inches, if that model is now within engagement range of any enemy models and did not fall back this turn, on an unmodified hit roll of the value shown on the table below, that attack scores an additional hit. So uh, on battle round three, if you roll six, you get an extra hit. If on battle round five, if you do a four up, you get an additional hit. Um, so potentially doubling the output of most units uh, by battle round five. So if these are relatively attractive benefits, what's the problem? Why is this you know, the, the worst of the two tactical philosophies? Um, and a big part of it is that it doesn't start until turn three, right? You can use Mon Ka, get some really strong benefits right at the beginning of the game when you have all of your models, and therefore you will you know, have the maximum benefit of that because all your models are still alive. Um, you, you give that up, and instead you take a you know, more modest benefit later in the game, which doesn't really sell very well, right? Like you're giving up a really strong benefit to take a relatively m more modest one uh, that's not going to have as big of an impact on your game because it's more modest and be especially because it's later in the game where there's less opportunity to have an impact, right? So it really uh, asks the question, why would you want to win later when you could win now, right? Why choose Cao Yun when I can take my Ka and have those benefits right away at where I'm going to get more impact out of it? Now, that's not to say there aren't redeeming qualities of Cao Yun, right? If we look at these benefits, they are pretty darn good, especially if we consider the grander army composition around Cao Yun besides just these direct benefits. So yes, the extra shots, particularly on turns four and five, are very good. Um, you are sustaining your firepower despite losses, right? Even though your army is getting smaller throughout the game, having the additional uh, hit means that you are maintaining some proportion of your offensive capability despite those losses. So even though your opponent is making you pick up models, they are not getting a reprieve from your firepower, which is a strong ability, right? Like that's, that uh, is not only a <laughs> really important um, logistical one, but it's also a kind of a psychological thing, right? Like your opponent is like, oh, I'm, I'm removing models, but I'm not actually feeling any better about it because I'm still taking more shots. Um, so there's that. Uh, but additionally, more generally, having uh, the exemplar of Cao Yun as a warlord trait is really strong. You can pick it regardless of if you take Cao Yun as your tactical philosophy, uh, but either case is a really useful tool. In Monka, you are able to redeploy one unit, but if you choose Cao Yun, you can redeploy three units either somewhere on the board or into reserves, which means that particularly for crisis suits, you have a whole bunch of maneuverability options, right? Crisis suits can start on the board, they can start in Manta Strike, or you could throw them in stored reserves. And the thing about Exemplar of the, of the Cao Yun is that it doesn't cost you uh, command points to put things in stored reserves using it. So you can be very cheeky with your crisis suit deployment uh, and put them on the board, but then redeploy them into stored reserves at no cost using that Warlord trait. This has a benefit over Manta striking in the way that you don't have to take stealth suits, you don't have to take homing beacons, you don't have to rely on the stealth suit surviving and performing the action of the homing beacon in order to get those um, stealth suits down in a in this kind of alternative deployment strategy. Um, of course, 
With uh, homing beacons, you're able to do that turn one. You can't do that out of stored reserves. So there is clearly still a benefit to stealth suits, um, even in this in this framework. But it's an alternative, right? You you have an alternative option here that is less risky, but also potentially less rewarding. But it's a tool, right? It's a tool that we can use in a greater strategy. Beyond that, uh, the Devilfish also have a really interesting mechanic that interacts with Kao Yun. If you are selecting Kao Yun as your tactical philosophy, those Devilfish, if they're within nine inches of board edge, can move off the board into strategic reserves and then back on, uh, right? So you can use this in a bunch of different ways. You can avoid damage, right? So you can keep those Devilfish alive by having them hop off the board so that your opponent can't shoot them on their turn and then have them hop back on the board. That keeps the Devilfish alive, but also keeps the passengers alive, right? So if you have like a Fireblade or Ethereal as your Warlord, they can be in that Devilfish hop on and off um, and avoid being, being shot in that way, which is pretty powerful if you're looking to deny your opponent some opportunities. It also allows you to rapidly ambush certain parts of the board, right? You can set up ambushes, you can, you know, deploy your uh, Delfish on one side of the board and, and move them to the other side of the board in the next turn through this ability. Or you can grab objectives, right? Really easily. You can move from one side of the board to the next, grab an objective. Uh, so that is a really cool mechanic that really does amplify the benefit of Kao Yun as a tactical philosophy. And so in thinking about how we might use Kao Yun, it occurs to me that we probably still want to do a lot of the same things that we do with Mon Ka, but just benefit from the Kao Yun rule set, right? I think that's, maybe I don't know, maybe that's super obvious. Let me know in the comments if you think that this is a uh, really dumb and like a no-brainer, but um, right, like why would we not play the army the same way um, and just get different benefits, right? Like the codex is clearly built in a way that is meant to be very aggressive, very mobile, and that's kind of counterintuitive in a Cao Yun mindset because we've been conditioned to think of Cao Yun as this kind of more defensive, castly approach um, after codex after codex has, has told us that's how the army plays. But that's not how this codex plays, right? This codex is meant to be aggressive, meant to be mobile. Um, and so I think we still want to do all those same things, even if we're using Kao Yun, but just, you know, a, a slight twist on, on that theme, right? So why can't we still have the strong alpha strike using Kao Yun, uh, but also get these late game benefits that allow us to to kind of have a bit of both worlds, not necessarily, not definitely not the best of both worlds, uh, but but a part of both worlds, right? Let's have a Montca play style, but benefit from Cao Yun rules, and so that's what the list that we are building today is going to do. In order to do this, we are going to exploit our opponent's assumptions of how we're going to play the army. Now, the presumption is that Montca is the better strategy, so your opponent probably assumes that you will Montca. And we're going to lean into that assumption by taking Farsight Enclaves, which will probably telegraph that we're definitely going to take Monka, right? But we're not going to do that. We're going to take that assumption and use it to our advantage and Kao Yun instead. Kind of turn the tables, take what they think they know about our army, and use that to put them in a position that they don't want to be in, right? So I mean this very literally, that they can't counter your Mon Ka if you Kao Yun, because Kao Yun allows us to redeploy and uh, mitigate their counter, all right? So we're going to make a list that, of course, can Mon Ka, right? If, if we're in a situation where this is not actually a good idea, we can certainly Mon Ka, and that's pretty true for most army lists in the book, right? Like, Mon Ka is very strong. Most of the things in the codex are pretty good. And so, you know, it's it's pretty hard to build a list that isn't going to do well with Mon Ka, I think. Um, but the list we build here is going to be something that we're intending to use Kao Yun with, especially if we are going first, right? So if we go first, we mitigate some of the timing issues with Kao Yun because our third turn is only after two of their turns. Right, so we we are getting the benefit a little bit sooner than we might if we were going second, um, but but of course we can we can choose uh, in the game, right? So we can choose to Monka if we want, we can choose to Kao Yun if we want, uh, especially if we're going first. That might be a more advantageous time to choose Kao Yun. But the crux of this is that we are going to deploy everything in a denied flank deployment. That means everything is going to go to one side. 
right? So we're going to put everything on the left side of the table, let's say. And your opponent's going to see that and say, all right, uh, you don't have anything going in stored reserves. You don't have anything going in Manta Strike. Everything's on the table on this one side and you're Mon Kang, so everything is just going to come straight forward at me. So in response to that, I'm going to deploy in a particular way. Now they might be you know, keen enough to notice that you have um, cow, exemplar of the Cao Yun as a second Warlord trait, and they might say, okay, well, if you're Mon Kang, you can redeploy one unit. So maybe I have to be a little concerned about something uh, from that. But they're, again, going to assume that you're Mon Kang and not going to Cao Yun. So they're not going to anticipate a, a mass redeploy that would be possible under this strategy. So they're really going to be responding to what you're telegraphing you're going to do. You're telling them in a lot of ways that you're going to Manka. And so they're going to respond to that. They're going to deploy in a very particular way in response to that. And part of that is probably going to include having a vulnerable opposite flank, right? They're going to overemphasize their deployment on one side of the board relative to the other. And so that means one side of the board is going to be more open for uh, things to come in from stored reserves or um, just generally not very well protected. That means that their deployment is very vulnerable to something like a pincer maneuver between things coming in from strategic reserves and a bunch of devilfish running up the board. All right, so let's actually talk about the the list finally, right? Uh, So of course, we're taking Farsight Enclaves. It's going to be a double patrol detachment. Uh, So we're not taking a battalion. We're taking two two patrols in order to get the most cold stars that we can. the Warlord is going to be one of these cold stars with the Exemplar of the Manka. We're going to use uh, Promising Pupil to take Exemplar of the Kao Yun on another cold star. Um, and then that gives us a lot of flexibility, it gives us a lot of options. We can use the Exemplar of the Manka to get some really nice rerolls, and we can use Exemplar of the Kao Yun in order to do our redeploy gimmicks. Um, the list actually includes uh, one cold star with a seal generator, positional relay. That's true for all three cold stars. They're both going to have a shield gen and a positional relay in order to uh, facilitate these uh, outflanking maneuvers, but also give them a little bit of durability. Uh, then the first one's going to have a flamer that I'm going to upgrade to the thermoneutronic projector to give it a bit of a punch, uh, literally. And then also a fusion blaster, and it's going to have the Bigel Hunter's Plate, which is a relic uh, that is going to make it pretty darn durable. Um, The second cold star, in addition to the shield generator and positional relay, is going to have a high output burst cannon and fusion blaster. Um, Thus, the third one will also have the high output burst cannon and fusion blaster, but they will have different relics. The second one has the Honor Gauntlet, again, very punchy. And then the uh, third one is going to have the multi-sensory discouragement array, which is going to allow it to uh, mess with the opponent, right? We're going to be able to have their move distance or critically prevent uh, them from having objectives secured. So we're going to be able to take over objectives really easily with this guy Um, or, you know, consistently, maybe not easily, but consistently. Uh, And then uh, our last HQ slot is going to be a Cadre Fireblade, and he's going to be there to uh, pump up some uh, breachers that we have. So uh, as typical for for most lists now, we're going to have a uh, triple uh, breacher squad in three devilfish uh, setup. So that's um, that's a big chunk of points there. And then we're going to have one unit of crew. These guys are going to be uh, there to kind of um, run some interference, but largely just be a distraction, be something to kind of hold the deployment zone um, and give us a little bit of board control earlier on. I'm also going to take a unit of Pathfinders with three rail rifles. Pathfinders kind of on choice for Farsight Enclaves because Farsight Enclaves isn't as reliant on market lights as uh, uh, any other sept, really. Um, But rail rifles are really nice. Um, They're also going to give us some board control early on. Pulse carbines can be pretty good, too. Um, Just give us some extra shots. And they're also going to synergize with the Sky Ray here. So on turn one, I'm going to deploy my Sky Ray behind Obscuring Terrain, and I'm going to have these Pathfinders throw some marker lights on on something and have the Sky Ray, uh, you know, click away at something uh, that's out of line of sight for it because there's a stratagem that allows you to do that. So uh, the Pathfinder is going to allow indirect fire from the Sky Ray, keeping the Sky Ray alive, and the Pathfinders are there um, as board control. And, and I don't know, maybe they're like a distraction Pathfinder <laughs> turn one or something. Um, maybe. Uh, yeah. And then really the, the powerhouse of the list is the four or three units of four crisis suits. Um, 
Uh, the first two are identical. They have a plasma rifle, fusion blaster, and cyclic ion blaster on each of them. That's a really consistent uh, loadout to take out anything uh, toughness five or higher. It's very flexible, does a lot of damage consistently. Uh, so generally a pretty good choice, especially considering that our breachers are going to have a pretty good handle on anything smaller. And then we can supplement either uh either type of target with our cold stars and with the sky ray. So we're going to get a good good spread of offensive abilities here with this loadout. We have three of those crisis suits in that four-man team with shield generators, one with early warning override so that we can potentially overwatch uh, easily with them, and then of course iridium armor on one of those suits. The third unit of crisis suits is going to be more anti-infantry focused. It's going to have a burst cannon, air bursting fragmentation projector, and then a flamer. Um, so the burst cannon is going to give us good output, going to get some rules to trigger off of that. It's also going to have um, the AFP in order to have indirect fire, and then the flamer, of course, for guaranteed hits uh, at a good, good rate of fire. Three shield gens, early warning override, iridium armor as well on those for the same reasons. This depends on a couple different tools uh, in the Tau arsenal. For one, it depends on, as we mentioned, the exemplar of the Cao Yun Warlord trait. It allows you to redeploy uh, into strategic reserves. If you're choosing Cao Yun, you can do that up to three times without paying any additional CP. So we're going to be doing that. We're going to be taking full advantage of that, um, particularly with our heavy, heavy hitter crisis suit units. We're also going to rely on the Cold Star Positional Relay. The Positional Relay is a piece of war gear you can take on any commander, so it doesn't have to be a Cold Star, but the fact that a Cold Star can move very quickly or even uh, jump into Stored Reserve itself and then come back down means that you can put a Cold Star in a really opportune place to use a Positional Relay. Um, it allows you to bring Stored Reserves in on turn two as if it were turn three, or you know, turn three as if it was turn four. And so you have a lot of options as far as where they're going to be coming in. So your strategic reserves come can come in potentially in the oppo opponent's deployment zone if you're able to get your cold star in the right place very early in the game, meaning that you have a lot of flexibility on where those uh, strategic reserves units are coming in. Finally, we are going to be using the Delphish's tactical disen disengagement role, which we've already referenced. Uh, that's the thing that allows the Delphish to hop off the board edge and come back on via uh, strategic reserves. So again, these will be deployed on the table in that denied flank formation, uh, but they can hop into strategic re strategic reserves turn one uh, or turn two later on if they need to. Um, or they can just run up the board depending on, on the specifics of the uh, matchup. But uh, the important part here is that there's a lot of flexibility, right? We're still limited in how many units can be in strategic reserves based on um, based on the, the point cap, right? So we can only have half of our army in strategic reserves. And so we have choices on what that is. We can't put the whole army in strategic reserves. And we don't necessarily want to do that anyway. Um, but but we can select, we can pick and choose which units do that in a way that maximizes our opportunity to, to uh, take out some, some key units on the opponent's side early on. Oftentimes I find it helpful to visualize a list looking at the actual models. Like lists on paper don't necessarily make that much sense to me until I look at them on the board. And so here's another way of looking at that list, right? We have our cold stars, we have our, our uh, crisis suits, we have our breachers and devilfish. Uh, and then we have kind of the, these supplementary units on the side. Um, and so we have our three main action groups here, the Delafish and the, and the suits, um, that all are going to be able to basically mirror, mirror each other using this strategy, right? We deploy everything in the deployed flank uh, formation. The Delafish are on the board. The crisis suits get pushed off into strategic reserves. The uh, cold stars move up the board uh, alongside the Devilfish are then able to hop out and uh, allow us to pull in our crisis suits on turn two. And we can do kind of that, that, um, that, that pincer maneuver, exploiting the opponent's uh, bias towards one side of the board um, through that um, exemplar of the Cao Yun warlord trait. 
So again, exploiting their assumptions, putting this army in a little bit different position than it would be expected to be in, and uh, having some good fun with that. That's the general idea. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Uh, is this something that appeals to you? Is this uh, not that exciting? Whatever you think, uh, are there changes you'd make to the list? Let me know and let's have that discussion. As always, thanks for watching and happy wargaming. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. A while ago I made my own miniature. If you are interested in showing your support for the channel on the tabletop, you can pick one up either on Etsy if you're in the US or directly through me worldwide. Special thanks to our sponsor, The Magnet Baron, and also all the good folks over on Patreon, especially Mate Monk, Marcy, A Little Pink Monster, Benaby Jones, Durza, Ever Keller, Robbie Goodwin, Jose Gomez, Ruger, Drew Pratley, Michael Byrne, Zealous Brinstone, Scott Heater, Stephen Cowan, Jared Egler, Chris Kessler, Tao Oswell, and Shifty.